Ladies and gentlemen, to begin the 42nd Annual Policy Conference, please welcome the President of the American Academy of Nursing, Diana Mason. Good afternoon and welcome to the American Academy of Nursing's 2015 Transforming Health Driving Policy Conference. I'm Diana Mason, President of the Academy, and it's wonderful to see so many friends and colleagues here this afternoon. We have an exciting three days in store as we look forward to a conference that highlights strategies and initiatives that are transforming health, leading change, influencing policy, and improving lives, most importantly. I'm pleased to report that we have a record number of registrants this year with over a thousand people attending. First, please join me in thanking all of our sponsors for making this policy conference possible. We are grateful for their generous support. Please thank all of the sponsors that you're seeing on the screen. We began this year's gathering with this morning's leadership workshop and luncheon. These are signature events for the Academy's Institute for Nursing Leadership as we ramp up this work. The workshop helped over 200 fellows to think about how to secure the appointments that will tap into their substantial expertise and to think through some of the challenges of serving on governing boards, commissions, task forces, and other state and national policy-related entities. The incomparable Sheila Burke shared her own rich stories about serving in various federal and national leadership positions. And those of you who were there, I think, will agree with me that it was an outstanding presentation. You'll hear more about the Academy's Institute for Nursing Leadership at our business meeting on Saturday morning at 8.30. I hope to see you all there. But I want to take this moment to publicly thank Angela McBride, Chair of the Institute's National Advisory Council, and Stephanie Ferguson, Co-Chair, for doing such an extraordinary job of leading our work in this first year. Are, are Angela and Stephanie here? Thank them. There she is. The plenary sessions for this year's conference have been developed with expert input from our conference planning advisory committee. Could you join me in applauding their stellar works once I've called their names and they stand? The co-chairs are Susan Albrecht, Bernice Coleman, and Ramon Lavandero, and committee members Susan Apold, Mary Hagel, Luke Pelletier, Mary Ellen Roberts, Mona Newsom-Wicks, and CE liaison Lola Fair. Thank you so much for all of your great work. This year's plenary sessions continue our annual focus on health policy issues where the engagement and perspective of nurses is critical to promote health and improve health care. There will be three groups of education sessions, the plenary sessions, tomorrow's policy dialogues, high quality e-posters that you can view upstairs in the Constitution foyer. So I encourage you to take advantage of the full conference. You also asked for more participant involvement. And when you ask, we listen. We'll try that in two ways. We'll continue to have an open microphone toward the end of each session. But we invite you to submit questions during these sessions. And there are index cards on your table. And you can write questions during the presentations and raise your hand that you've got one. And there are Jonas scholars around the room who will come and take your questions and share them with the moderator. We probably will not get to every question, but the moderators will do their best. So, to get us kicked off today, please welcome our opening keynote speaker, Risa Leviso More, and our moderator, Joanne Kennan, to the stage. <laughs> Risa 
Aviso More is present, for those of you who don't know, is president and CEO of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, a position she's held since 2003. Under her leadership, the foundation has refocused on building a comprehensive culture of health for all, extending the foundation's 40-year history of addressing key public health issues. A specialist in geriatrics, Livia Zamore came to the foundation from the University of Pennsylvania, where she served as the Sylvan Ellsman Professor of Medicine and Healthcare Systems. She also directed Penn's Institute on Aging and was Chief of Geriatric Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing, uh, School of Medicine. We could have, oh, we wouldn't have, we could consider that. We could work on that. I think Tony's in the audience. She also co-chaired a congressionally requested Institute of Medicine study on racial and ethnic disparities on healthcare. Of course, it's been under her leadership that the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation commissioned the Institute of Medicine's report on the future of nursing, a landmark report that is changing our profession and what society expects of us. And we thank you for that. Thank you. Her support has continued as the foundation has funded the campaign for action at AARP for 10 years to oversee implementation of the recommendations throughout the country. Risa earned her medical degree from Harvard Medical School and also holds an MBA from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. She is a member of the National Academy of Medicine, formerly the Institute of Medicine, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the President's Council for Fitness, Sports, and Nutrition. She currently serves on the Smithsonian Institution Board of Regents and several other boards of directors. Last year, I was quite pleased to present Risa with the Academy's President's Award for her sustained leadership in advancing health and health care. She couldn't be with us then, but I'm delighted that she will kick off this year's conference. And I'm also delighted that the moderator for this session will be Joanne Kennan, the health care editor of Politico, who has covered health policy and politics in Washington for 20 years. She spent more than a decade on Capitol Hill covering health care as a Reuters correspondent and wrote extensively about end of life, hospice, and palliative care <clears throat> during a Kaiser Family Foundation Media Fellowship in 2007. She's won national awards for a Washingtonian magazine story about the suicide of a senator's son and for a Slate magazine article on palliative care in the emergency department. She's been a commentator on radio and television programs, including NPR, the BBC, C-SPAN, and the PBS NewsHour. She got her start in journalism as an editor at the Harvard Crimson, unless you count her second grade experience as the founding editor <laughs> of the Teeny Town News. <laughs> Ms. Cannon joined Politico and Politico Pro in 2011. Politico's healthcare coverage has expanded under her leadership as Washington and the states have wrestled with changes in the delivery of healthcare. We're delighted to have them with us today and I well welcome Risa to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, and thank you, Diana, for that wonderful introduction. And, and actually, you know, I was on the faculty of the School of Nursing, so uh, uh, you got it right. Um, so let me start out by just saying how thrilled I am to be among uh, this great crowd of nurse leaders for a second day, uh, a profession of individuals who are inspiring in uh, every way possible. You are three million strong, the largest group of health professionals in the country. And uh, as I think all of you know, but it always bears repeating that Gallup polls consistently rank nursing as the most trusted profession. And for good reason, because you care expertly and compassionately for people at their most vulnerable times. Nurses play a key role in our most important transitions in life when we're born, and when we leave this world. And you often do it without a lot of fanfare, quietly, but compassionately. Now recently I read a story of um, Renee, uh, a NICU nurse in Marietta, Georgia, 
who was reunited with all of the children that she had saved over her long career as a neonatal intensive care nurse. And many of you may have seen the video that's made the rounds uh, on social media. It's actually gone viral. And what's remarkable about this is uh, not so much the comments that the parents make about how caring she was uh, and her nursing skills, but the things that they say about how she helped them connect with those very fragile little babies that were their children and made them more confident as parents. Now, the reunion was a surprise. And what's telling about this is the words that Renee used when she saw all of these families coming in. She said, my babies, my babies. Now what that tells us is the kind of sacred responsibility that she feels for every little child in her care. And then there's the ER nurse, Jonathan Bartels, who has seen firsthand the other end of the spectrum. And as we all know, despite our best efforts many times, patients do die. And because there's always so much more to do, so many more people to try and save, he and his fellow trauma workers would just rush on to the next patient, not taking time to mourn the loss. And that led to stress and burnout. And then one day, he saw a hospital chaplain just pause after a patient's death. And that emboldened him to do the same thing when he was in a similar session, situation. And he recalls saying, let's just stop for a moment and recognize this person uh, who's in the bed. Because before they came here, they were alive, they were interacting with their family, they had loved ones, they had a life. And his vision for the pause, as we now know it, took off. Healthcare workers began accepting that they could take up a moment and not disconnect emotionally in the way we had been doing before. This idea spread throughout his hospital and now throughout the country. And all because a nurse took the bold step of asking everyone to stop and then change the way that they were doing things. So that's why I'm so honored to be with you and honored to be working alongside uh, the ranks of the academy and two people that I have to give a shout out to because they're going to join the ranks of the fellows uh, later on in the program. Two people at the foundation who are working to build a culture of health, Paul Kuhnert and John Lumpkin. Um, As I said, they are uh, trailblazers and working to build a, a culture of health. And so uh, let me just keep on that theme of a culture of health. You know, I spoke last night about building a comprehensive culture of health in America. And uh, we talked a lot about it last night. I'm not going to say all that I said last night. But I do want to just take a little bit to explain what I mean uh, for those of you who weren't there. Now, we all know instinctively uh, when we talk about a culture of health, it, it's a phrase that means many different things to different people. Uh, some people think of it as a culture of well-being, others of a culture as a culture of care or empathy. But whatever you call it, a culture of health is all about providing every person with the opportunity and the means to live the healthiest life that they possibly can. You know, a culture of health means that our children's health is a matter of fact, not a matter of chance. That our kids are able to learn to be active, to eat right, to stay safe, and to help others do that same thing at home, at school, when they're playing. A culture of health means that high quality, efficient, and affordable care is available to everyone when and where they need it, and that the care is actively promoting not just the cure of illness, but promoting health as well. And in a culture of health, industry leaders understand that the well-being 
of their employees boost the bottom line and vice versa, and they do what they need to do to keep their employees and the communities in which their employees live vital and productive. Now, this is a vision that I know all of us in this room share, and I believe that it's one that we can achieve. It's, um, some would say, an audacious vision, but I'm here to say today that I think we can do it as a nation, but we can't do it without nurses. In fact, the Academy of Nursing has laid out a strategic plan and goals that I believe are absolutely essential to building a culture of health. You focused on achieving the triple aim, you know, improving patient experience, making sure that we improve care uh, and the population's health, and also reduce costs. You said that you will lead efforts in partnership with others to address a broad range of factors that affect the population's health. And finally, you've wanted to put nurses in the key position to lead change in healthcare policy and to drive that change in policy settings. So it seems to me that nurses understand as a part of your DNA what we need to do if we're going to grow a movement that helps us have everyone be as healthy as they can be. Those of you who know me uh, know that I've said many times, nurses are a force to be reckoned with. Uh, not just because of the sheer numbers, but because you are strong in will, uh, you're passionate about your work, and you care deeply about the people that are in your care. And you know how to get difficult things done, because that's what nurses do every day. You get difficult things done. Now, when I look at the goals of this conference, transforming health and building a better health care system, getting difficult things done, uh, I rest my case. <laughs> but change is not going to happen unless we integrate our actions more effectively so that we can accelerate pro progress. And the factors that influence health don't exist in isolation. And so we have to recognize that the solutions can't exist in isolation either. That means that we all have to get out of our comfort zones and start to work across sectors. Now, the Academy has acknowledged this very clearly in your strategic goals. And like us, you're asking the nation to start improving health by working together with business leaders, with educators, with urban planners, with faith leaders, with people that we haven't ordinarily worked with in the health industries. You're asking similar questions, like how can we help sectors work across and between uh, boundaries that have traditionally held us back? How can our actions connect to one another? And what specific measures can we actually use to gauge our improvement? Well, at the foundation, we've been working over the last year uh, to develop an action framework that we hope will highlight the critical areas where we all can take action to improve the health and well-being and to promote greater equity. Now, the framework is the, progress, the, the product of rigorous research and a lot of uh, collaboration and work done in conjunction with the RAND Corporation. We've had valuable input over the last year from experts and partners, including uh, many of our nursing colleagues all around the country. Now, everyone who worked on this approached it with one question that was driving them. What is holding our nation back from the health that we aspire to have? And the framework is designed to build on the energy and legacy of those who've worked in health all these years. But it also wants to open the door to new allies, especially those who haven't seen themselves as doing very much in health at all until now. We want to provide entry points for people who resonate with different sectors so that they can begin to see how their work can contribute to a vision 
for building a culture of health. So in the time I have today, what I want to do is share that framework, and then Joanne and I are going to uh, have a little talk where you can ask questions and dig into some of the, the details. So here's the framework. As you can see, it reflects a vision of how health and well-being are the sum of many parts. There are four action areas that are connected and influenced by one another. And these action areas are intended to mobilize the efforts and integrate uh, a course of action that where many individuals, communities, and sectors can work together to advance progress. Now, you know that this kind of focus is needed because that's what the Academy's goals have always been about. But what I want to stress is that uh, equity and opportunity are overarching in this entire framework and infused throughout it. The action framework is designed so that we can improve the health of the population and the well-being of the population and in so doing have greater equity. So let me talk about each of the areas. This is action area one, making a shared value for health. This action area places our nation's values and expectations about health front and center. It emphasizes the importance of achieving, maintaining, and reclaiming health as a shared priority, defined in different ways for different people in different communities. Now, each action area, as you can see, has a series of drivers. And in action area one, the drivers are mindset and expectations, a sense of community, and civic engagement. The drivers are the engine of the action framework. And they provide a set of long-term priorities that we hope individuals and organizations and sectors uh, across the nation will be able to rally around. So I challenge every nurse here to think about the Academy's focus on the health of populations and to think about how you can empower those that you work with, the people that you uh, see as advocates, to get more involved in health promotion. Let me give you an example. There's a program called Vote and Vaccination that uh, the foundation launched in 2004, and it set up flu vaccination clinics at or near polling sites. Um, now, Vote and Vax, as it's uh, more commonly known, had a real impact. From 2004 to 2010, about 40,000 flu shots were given in 44 states in the District of Columbia. And about half of those flu shots went to people who didn't usually get them. Now, can you imagine what would happen? How many more people would be reached if nurses all across the country set up volunteer efforts with local pharmacies to make sure that every polling place, at every election, in every community had a vote and vax program? What better time to start than at these upcoming elections. I think uh, they're going to be intense. <laughs> now, the, an understatement. I hear that. I heard that over there. <laughs> the other point is that these um, action areas are the drivers that we think are the building blocks of the framework. Um, they will remain constant over time, but the measures are going to change. I think they need to re reflect as how we will evolve and progress. And uh, they encourage people to think about areas that are broader than the ones that we typically put in the health domain. So for example, a couple of the measures in action area one uh, include the percentage of people who volunteer and the percentage of people who are eligible to vote who vote. And now you can see why I gave you the example of the Vote and Vax program. The most important part of the culture of health measures is that they're meant to provide a menu of actions where people can actually get engaged and begin to help build a culture of health. 
Now, we expect that the measures are going to evolve over time and they're going to keep pace with the needs of what is going on and complement other measures that we know are critically important, like Healthy People 2020 and the National Academy of Medicine's uh, measures. But the key thing is these are umbrellas. Now, let me turn to action area two, fostering cross-sector collaboration to improve well-being. This action area places a new emphasis on the collabor collaborations that include sectors that typically don't see themselves in healthcare. They're outside of healthcare. And progress across sectors in collaboration that we've seen in recent years is, is absolutely important. It's encouraging, but we've got to make sure that more of it happens if we're going to reach the full potential. So the drivers here are intended to energize the existing partnerships that we have, but also bring in new allies. So here's a real world example. The Dow Chemical Company has taken a lead in something that's called the Michigan Health Improvement Alliance. People from Michigan may have heard of that. And it's a group of cross-sector stakeholders who are working to improve the health and healthcare delivery systems in about 14 counties in Michigan. Now, um, what's key about this is that it involves the whole community, uh, and Dow has actually been able to demonstrate a decrease in chronic disease uh, among its employees and a decrease in spending as a result of this program and uh, the, the positive impacts that they've seen on diabetes and other chronic diseases. So again, it's an example of the triple aim coming to life. What I'd like each nurse in this room today to do is think about how you can champion programs like this in your communities. What if school nurses banded together with occupational nurses and acute care nurses and public health nurses and led efforts in their communities to bring work and businesses and urban planners and city planners and government leaders together to create a better, healthier community. I have to say, you would be unstoppable and the change would be inevitable. Now, action area three, creating healthier, more equitable communities. The goal of this action area is to encourage communities to build their greatest potential by improving the environment in which residents live, learn, work, and play. And make the healthy choice the easy choice. So here, there are measures such as access to healthy foods, youth safety, early education, and that bring the physical, social, and emotional, and economic factors together that can make a community healthier. We also have a measure in, in this area on air quality so that we can look at the percentage of the population that is covered by comprehensive clean air uh, smoke-free laws. So I always have to go back to the impact that this has when communities really rally around that because I love the work of Charlotte Parent, the nurse in New Orleans who with the advocates and the health department was able to convince the city to put a ban on public smoking. Um, which is a pretty amazing feat. Um, so action area four uh, focuses on strengthening and integrating the health services and systems. And this action area uh, is designed to strengthen the coordination and integration and balance between medical treatment, public health, and social services. So by driving access, by improving consumer experiences, and balancing the integration between what happens inside and outside of the hospital, we think that it provides a culture of health that will empower both patients and providers. Now some of you may know the work of Jan Walker, who's a nurse with a background in business and health services research. Now she understands how important it is to give patients information that they can use to improve and understand their own care. 
She works with Tom Del Banco at the Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital, and there they created a program called Open Notes, which is very simple but revolutionary because they recognize that by sharing information with, with patients, you can encourage them to play a more active role in their care. So on the face of it, it was just very simple. Walker knew that medical teams were already documenting their uh, notes and that with the increasing movement towards electronic medical records, all of these notes were digitalized. And so it was gonna make it much easier to share those notes with the people that really needed to see them. But what's different is transparency. By sharing their findings and encouraging patients to review them and ask questions, they've created a, kind of, a new kind of clinician-patient dialogue that really hasn't occurred until now. Now, in the last area, as we make progress towards integrating these four action areas, we believe that we can actually approach a time when the desired outcome of improving the population's health and well-being and equity can be achieved. So what I want to ask each of you today to do is to help. When you get home, choose an action area or two or three and bring your extraordinary skills and ability to get out and get these things done. Join with others and build a culture of health that is in your workplace, in your neighborhoods, in your communities, because that's the only way we're gonna get it done. So I thank you for your incredible work uh, that you've already done to improve the health of our nation. But I just wanna tell you, you gotta keep your foot on the accelerators. I want you to see yourselves as the leaders of the framework and how and understand that only you can make the impact. This room is filled with so many Renee's and Jonathan's nurses who uh, had the foresight to say, let's stop, let's take a moment, and then let's take action. It's a difficult task, but it's not impossible if we dedicate ourselves to it. So in closing, I just want to say it all makes me think about something that uh, another great, courageous woman said, Amelia Earhart. The most difficult decision is to act. After that, it's just tenacity. Here's to tenacity. I think you've been told there's going to be a, uh, two ways that you can ask questions. We're going to chat for a while, but then there is uh, mics that you can stand up by a little later, and there are also cards I think that you have or will be given and they'll be collected. Um, you know, recently we were talking backstage, and I was recalling when she began talking about obesity and childhood obesity, and it was really... I don't know if it's quite an obsession, but it was an area of concentration. <laughs> and I think a lot of people didn't understand it at first, that we, under, we didn't understand it as a public health problem. We, didn't, we thought it was fat kids, and you know, it was a cosmetic problem. And we didn't understand it was an epidemic and where it was going to go. And over time, and, and our WGF was really, and, and your voice was really important in that change, and we now think of it as a public health problem. I think the phrase culture of health is something that people are still trying to, um, not this audience so much, mm -hmm. they've, they've heard you twice and they came here knowing about it. Um, but, but I mean, how do you explain like the difference between social determinants of health, which is another thing you've done a lot of work on, and the culture of health? How do you, what's, how do you think about the difference and how do you explain the difference? Yeah. Well, I, uh, the culture of health is really a vision. It's, uh, it's a North Star, where we'd like to, to be in a generation, and I realize that's ambitious to say we could get there in a generation. The social determinants of health, um, much like the triple aim, is uh, an avenue. Are, these are the things we've got to consider and work on if we're actually going to get there. We've, we've tried to solve the problems uh, in our healthcare system and help our population to be healthier by staying focused on the things within the healthcare system. And frankly, we've been at it a long time and it hasn't, hasn't worked. 
And so now, social determinants are saying, geez, there's so many more factors that influence whether a person is able to get and stay healthy. We've got to look at those and build a systems approach to including that in our solutions, just as with the triple aim, we've got to look at populations and the experience that patients have and the cost. So it's creating a big tent where multiple uh, kinds of approaches can be integrated in a systems way. And how does it fit into, I mean, many people here are probably involved in one way or another with programs like the Million Heart Program or uh, Healthy People 2020. How, how do the, these are sort of concrete um, programs with steps and goals and, and you know, we have metrics everywhere we look in healthcare now. Um, how does this sort of cultural goal, which is, I don't want to say it's vaguer, because that's, I mean, you, you were very concrete there too, but it's, it is out in the future and it is um, an aspiration. So how does things like the Million Hearts, how, how do they fit together? Well, when you look at a lot of uh, the measures associated with some of these other efforts, they really do focus on the work that we do traditionally in this room. Uh, the work that healthcare professionals do, um, as opposed to encouraging us to reach out beyond the walls of the healthcare system, if you will, and in include others uh, more directly. So when, uh, so that it, they complement each other in that way because I think that most people are starting to understand that we aren't gonna be able to have healthy populations if we don't have a built environment that supports those healthy populations. We aren't gonna be able to continue to, to move in a direction where our kids can uh, be more physically active if we don't include school administrators and educators. And so these measures and the framework tries to reach out and encourage people to embrace not only the more narrow measures, but the broader ones. And I think if you crosswalk the two, you'll see that there's a lot of overlap. Um, I want to talk about nurses as leaders and nurses as change agents, which are not synonyms, but they're related. And one of the, and there are, f there are a few aspects of that to discuss, but one of the priorities that, that our WJF has made or beginning to look at is getting nurses on boards. So talk about what you're doing. I think you're sort of still, I was looking on the website, yeah. you know, I think you're still in the study stage, you're counting, and then how do you make those numbers soar? You know, um, I don't know that we fully know how we're gonna make the numbers soar, and that's, uh, that's a, a theme I want to, again, put out here, is uh, we are realizing increasingly in philanthropy that if we're going to make real progress, there are many aspects of of sol driving solutions that require us to co-create. So uh, a part of what we're trying to do is understand what makes a successful board member, how boards are reaching out to different people, and then spotlight those uh, avenues and accelerate them. We know that a lot of the things that we've tried in the past to get nurses on boards um, haven't been as successful as we would like. Uh, but we also know that we've got to think more broadly about the kind of boards that nurses are on. We talk about corporate boards, we talk about healthcare uh, industry boards, but we also need to think about those boards in community uh, organizations where you can have a very broad influence. The boards of the wise, the United uh, Way, the, the local community boards that are really the places where you can bring that knowledge that nurses have about caring and community and analytics and research to a group of people who are seeing it totally differently. And I think that being able to add that kind of value is uh, something that's going to help us accelerate the numbers of nurses on boards. So nurses as leaders, um, and nurses as chain, being, being a partner in cultural health doesn't necessarily mean being on a board, it means being a change agent and in, in, in how you live your life, how you do your job, and how you relate to your community and larger partners. You um, get it, thank you. <laughs> how, 
but they're not ident I mean, leader here we have nurse leaders, right? I mean, this is what this organization yeah. is. You know, you, but you also, I mean, when I talk about change in healthcare, I sometimes tell people it's really, you know, yeah, you need payment reform and you need CMMI and you need all that, but you also, it's anthropology. It's how a tribe changes. Uh -huh. So how can, not every woman or, or a nurse or, or you're not all women, but not everybody's gonna wanna be on the board. But probably everybody here wants to be a change agent. So how, what, talk about some of the opportunities, um, not just the opportunities, the imperatives for nurses to become change agents in, in, in institutions in healthcare don't always want to change as we see every day and aren't always open to the nurse as the agent of change. Yeah. <laughs> I, got a, I got a little laugh there. Change is hard. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's recognized by everyone in the room. Often we're in, or we're in organizations where the profession that is um, leading the organization is not particularly interested in changing. Um, like they, we need Comedy Central to have uh, that broadcast. <laughs> that said, uh, again, I go to uh, the ability of nurses to have credibility because of the trust that you have, because of the knowledge base in a lot of different organizations that are actually change agents in the culture that we live in. Um, whether those are transportation boards, uh, education boards, uh, and the like. And so a, a, a big part of, I think, creating this momentum for change is to get out of the silo of the healthcare institution where often uh, there is tremendous re resistance and go to the places where there's uh, a willingness or more willingness to create a kind of cultural change. And uh, when we look at, you, you referenced uh, childhood obesity, some of the most important gains in leveling off and reducing childhood obesity have come not because of the things that were done in environments where uh, the healthcare system changed, but in those cities and regions where there were massive changes in the uh, schools, where there was an advertising campaign, where there was a greater emphasis on parks and what's going on in the community stores. And those are the kinds of things that can be led by people in this room who are very knowledgeable about population health and nutrition and things like that and can take it to where people live, learn, work, and play. It's like creating normative change. Like exactly. we wear seat belts now and we didn't wear seat belts a long time ago. Um, even within, within nursing, because I mean, the professions you alluded to are not the only ones who can be change averse. I mean, you can be a nurse who's been trained and you can be a fantastic, conscientious, magnificent nurse and you still think your job is to take care, is, is bedside care, or taking care of a sick person. And that's certainly part of nursing, but many people here would see it as, that the role is larger, it's a, a, a societal role. Um, what advice do you have as you think about the culture of change, of culture of health, and you think about the directions you have to move to the nurse leaders to try to encourage this broader view to help people broaden their definition of what nursing is? Well, first of all, I think we can't diminish uh, the power of that one-on-one -on -one connection when uh, a nurse has the undivided attention of that patient in front of her or him. Uh, but the question that they can begin to ask is what's needed outside of that direct environment, that direct inter interaction to keep this person healthy? And then I think that's part of the reason why it's so important that the recommendations of the Institute of Medicine Future of Nursing, which call for continuing education, for people to understand that role in population health and to expand it because we are continuing to evolve as a, as a healthcare system and as a, a culture of health and it's gonna require that ongoing knowledge and commitment. So it's both and. Okay. Um, I've just gotten a batch of questions. There are two from the board and this is a perfect transition po uh, point here. Um, because you've referred to the IOM uh, mm -hmm. here, and these are two questions about that. Um, with the IOM impact study about the future of nursing report being released soon, what do you think the study will say, and how will you respond? To the extent that you can have your crystal ball. 
everyone who knows the uh, National Academy of Medicine knows that you don't know until it's released what it says, right? As a reporter, uh, sometimes we know and we just have to promise not to say, right? That's reporters. Uh, <laughs> but you can get ready. I, I, I know from the work that, that the various action coalitions are doing and uh, the reports that we get back that it's going to be a very promising report. Um, you, if you just look state by state at the tremendous gains that are being made in expanding the uh, scope of practice of nursing, if you look at the educational gains, uh, the number of baccalaureate trained nurses, uh, the amount of continuing education, I think it's going to be an incredibly positive report. Uh, that said, we know that there are also going to be things that we're going to want to continue to work on. Uh, scope of practice, we still have more to do there. We still want to see the diversity of nursing uh, increase. So there's going to be, I think, much to celebrate and to give us hope to keep that foot on the accelerator, and at the same time, some areas that I think we're gonna need to double down our efforts. And a related question also from the board. In 2010, the foundation committed to working toward the IOM Future of Nursing report. Today, you've talked about the culture of health. What does that mean for the IOM recommendations? Where's the connection? Well, one of, one of the things that has happened as a result of the coalitions that have been built all around the country and in every state is that we now have a group of people who have committed to action. They've committed to uh, seeing those goals through and as part of those goals, um, we're talking about uh, improving the, the role of nurses and that's frankly created a platform where nurses can work with others across sectors. We're starting to see that happen and I think that what the commitment and the foundation continues to have a commitment to, to the uh, campaign is that it's going to be an even stronger platform for not only achieving those recommend, recommendations, but also for building the kind of coalitions that are needed for a culture of health. This is an excellent question. Um, where's the role of the patient or the public in the culture of health? Uh, front and center. Uh, we have to... Last night I mentioned um, that when we stop talking about patients as patients and start thinking about them in the roles that they play outside of the hospital and outside of the clinic, they become our neighbors, uh, our family members, you know, the members of our community, and that's why they're integral to this. You know, one of the, um, just a, a little inside baseball in uh, the foundation, you know, we uh, often have meetings that are just the program staff. And we've stopped doing that so much. We've started having meetings that include all of our staff, irrespective of what their role is in the foundation to talk about a culture of health. And the reason for that is that everyone is invested in this. Um, it, whether you are a nurse, a doctor, an administrative assistant, you have something to say about the health of the nation, the health of your family, um, and the culture that it takes to set you up for success. So uh, I think that the, the patient, the consumer, is central to how we think about a culture of health. Uh, this question is how, to, and we could also have take people going up to the mics. There's one there, there's one there. I may have trouble seeing you, but we'll, we'll, you can start lining up and we'll figure that out. Um, how do you propose dealing with forces that are actively opposing a culture of health? And this questioner gives examples, some of which you may feel more comfortable than others talking about, the sugary beverage industry, the NRA, and fast foods. Hmm. <laughs> and I don't think they mean the fast foods with the salad bars. Right? Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, we've, we've really embraced uh, at the foundation is that we aren't gonna build a culture of health um, if we don't include the, the businesses that make the products and services that help define our culture. So that's the first point. The second point is that when you say that, uh, business and industries, even beverage industries and fast food uh, restaurants are not a monolith. 
And so I think one of the things that we have to understand is where there's an opportunity to change products, to help see how to reformulate, repackage, uh, and change the way people think about uh, their role in industry. Now that's not to say that there aren't some that probably aren't ever gonna get on board, and uh, so we won't spend our time working with those folks, but those that do see a role in trying to improve the health of the country, uh, I think our foundation and uh, the people in this room should look for ways to build bridges. Um, two related, there's questions about how does the culture of health framework and the, the multi-part strategy you've laid out, um, how does that reach or accommodate the needs of the people who are the most underserved and the most under, the disadvantaged? Mm. Well, you notice I said that equity had to be uh, included in every part of this. And uh, so if you, if you think about each of those four areas, one of the things that we're trying to do in each action area is ask, what are the uh, greatest barriers to achieving greater health? And let's focus on those. So for example, um, when we think about the kinds of things that prevent kids from being active, from feeling like they can be fully engaged in their community, uh, feel like they have some resilience. At the core of it, often when you talk to youth, they'll say safety. Safety is a critical element. It's at the core. So, that, so we're looking at safety as one of those factors. But in every dimension, we're asking ourselves, what are the communities, what are the areas where we've got to make sure we're tackling the most difficult problems in order to create greater equity. We have some questions over here. Can you identify yourself? And please make sure it's a question, not a speech. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't see who you, you can are. You has so. done this before. And I can't uh, see very well, so don't take it personally. I don't know who I'm telling that to, right? <laughs> Hi, I'm David Vlahov, and I'm dean at the UCSF School of Nursing, and also a co-director of the National Program Office of Evidence for Action and the Culture of Health Initiative. Uh, one of the things that I come across in talking with people is that the thinking around culture of health seems to continually change. Yeah. And you know, I guess we could say it's maturing. Where, where are we with this and what can we expect going into the future? Yeah. Well, David, thank you, and thank you for leading uh, the national program. I, I, would, I would put it this way, and I'd go, kind of go back to um, this concept of co-creating uh, strategy. One of the things that foundations have done for the last 20 years, and not just foundations but other funders, have tended to say, here's a set of goals, here's a logic model, if you will, and now we're going to put our head down and just kind of run with it. And uh, increasingly, we've realized, I think, as a, as a, as a country and as a group of, of researchers and, and clinicians and leaders, that that doesn't work well for changing complex systems and creating the kind of population health improvement that we're talking about. And so in order to really do that, what we've got to do is be much more rigorous about uh, doing that rapid cycle understanding of what's working and not working. And that's where uh, the program of really trying to have evidence-based action comes from. So what I see is a continual evolution, um, a, a focus on trying to understand what is really working, doing the research that tells us what's going on well in communities, what's not working, um, connecting people in other communities to that body of information, and then accelerating those things that are doing well and understanding where we've got to shift or pivot away from those things that are not going well. So the kind of program that creates that evidence-based action is something that increasingly our foundation and I think other foundations you'll see uh, making greater investments in. So thank you for, for leading that effort and for the question. On this side? Yeah. My name is Tenacity Lubick. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. <laughs> it, 
it has taken 40 years with a great deal of help from the Johnson Foundation in the early days to see the midwifery model and nurse midwives grow the freestanding birth center to now 313 in operation. And as of uh, Monday of this week, to see the CNN have a big article about us. I, you know, collaboration is required and uh, to see your vision become a reality. And that is very difficult because it means changing income patterns. Mm -hmm. And so the best ideas can be obstructed, as ours were for many, many years. It's just been the past couple of years that we find our medical colleagues reaching out to us. And uh, it's very satisfying, and I frankly didn't think I'd live long enough to see it. But <laughs> Tenacity. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, I'd like to know, Risa, what you feel, the, or what, if you could describe the difference between collaborations and coalitions. Collaborations and what? Coalitions. Coalitions. Well, I think one uh, describes the action uh, and the other describes, you know, essentially the body that you create as a result of those actions. The, uh, the act of reaching out and, and defining ways that you're going to work with actors across professions, but increasingly what we're saying is across sectors, and you've been so effective in doing that, often creates a kind of... Uh, coalition of people, a group that is now committed to the goals and furthering the, uh, the, the activities. So they go hand in hand, um, but one requires a kind of continual nurturance and, and culture of feeding, uh, and the other hopefully is what then becomes the platform for action. The question, if I might, which is, how you work with the systems of reimbursement that are already set up when they don't apply or they're looked on as ineffective or they're, they're, you're just not eligible for the support that's, that's needed. And there is support needed. Yeah. Well, that, it, we've had many conversations about this, and it's very difficult. Uh, from the perspective of a private foundation, what we can do is to try to uh, demonstrate new ways to solve those problems. Uh, often that has to be done locally uh, with rigor in de demonstrating that the, uh, the outcome and the payment is going to lead to the kind of effect you want. But then, frankly, it's um, the political action that takes that to scale. Now, there's a lot of... Uh, work that needs to be done to really understand how you can create the governance structures that prove uh, that savings from one area can be transferred to investments in other areas. And that's the kind of work, the creative work, I think, that foundations need to do now. But the hard work of, of changing the, the flow of funds as a result of the uh, policies that we have at the federal or state level often requires political action. And uh, that is something that people in this room uh, know all too well is not a linear path. Um, you have to, it's, uh, I was talking to Diana earlier, that's, uh, that's a ground game. And you've seen that, how difficult that is, certainly in the uh, scope of practice, uh, many, many discussions and debates and battles that you've engaged in over the, the last few years. So I wish I could say there was an easier way, but I think that's, uh, that's the reality of it. We can produce the evidence, and that's what we're uh, committed to trying to do. Thank you. Tenacity is after you. <laughs> There's several questions about violence as a public health problem. Yes. Gun violence is epidemic. Gang violence is a public health issue. Um, on the RWJF website, I looked at one of the nursing Google Hangouts, and there was a clinic, there was a lot of data also on uh, sexual violence and domestic violence. So how do those issues, um, how does culture of health provide opportunities, and how can nurses get involved in sort of coming up with, you can't solve those problems in the confines of a traditional, in a hospital. Mm -hmm. But where do they interact with culture of health, yeah. and what can the people here do about it? 
It's a uh, very difficult problem, and I, I know that we're never going to be um, a society that can really say we have a culture of health as long as we're violent, as long as we're as violent a country uh, and society as we are. Um, and one of uh, my board members, uh, Linda Burns Bolton, is here. She can attest that we've had many conversations about this. And where we've come out as a foundation is that the, the problem is one that has a long arc. Uh, and many people are looking at it uh, from a time horizon that is appropriate for their work, uh, which is often shorter than what a foundation can look at. There's a lot of evidence that uh, adverse experiences early in childhood have a profound effect on not only a child's resilience, but how they uh, interact and react uh, in the face of violence. And so what we've decided we're going to do as a foundation is, uh, since we can take a very long view, is to look at the the kind of uh, changes in early childhood support um, and understanding of the family and other environmental factors that can mitigate uh, violence in the long run. Uh, so that's our commitment at this point, but we will continue to fund programs like Cure Violence and, and programs like that that frame it as a public health issue um, as opposed to a criminal justice issue. And, uh, continue to invest in that way. Next question over here. Yes, Margaret Zalon, University of Scranton. Uh, how do you see nurses impacting the value of health as a human right, and how does that intersect with the goal of creating a culture of health? Hmm. Well, I would say that uh, if you look at that um, action area one, creating a, a shared value, when you talk to people about how they think about health, um, they often go to the, the people that are the most trusted to help them understand uh, how to make sense out of the conflicting aspects of health. And so I think nurses are primary educators informally and formally, and uh, helping the, the nation and our policymakers and uh, our curricula define health in a way that validates the basic rights that humans have, I think, is a, is a key role for nurses. Um, this is a question right up your alley, given your, your geriatrician. Uh, how are chronicity and frailty addressed in this model? Mm -hmm. It's not really a model in this framework. Yeah. Well, if you look at that um, action area that talks about the interaction between the healthcare system and everything else around it, a key component of that is better coordinated care and care that, is, that integrates what happens inside the healthcare system with the social services and public health. Uh, and I can tell you, as a, a geriatrician who used to make house calls, and I see someone here that I used to make house calls with, if the system around the patient is, um, is inadequate to meet and support them, uh, all the coordination will not do the trick. So it's a matter of the coordination, having the systems in place, and I think that's the main way we're gonna address the, the coming frailty that all of us um, are likely to have sometime in our lives. Okay, we have time for one more question up here. Uh, Lori Shirley, I sit on the uh, Florida Action Coalition, on the steering committee of the Florida Action Coalition. Great, thank you. And, oh, my pleasure. And we have been working very hard to remove uh, restrictions on practice for all APRNs. I was surprised in your fourth action item to only see nurse practitioners mention, and I'm specifically thinking of uh, my midwife colleagues who they have some of the strongest improvement and outcome data out there. I was wondering if that there was a reason why you focused only on the nurse practitioners in the particular direct directive or? Um... Yeah, that's, that's probably an area that we can broaden. I think that uh, the, the people that were working on this were looking at the, the, the sheer numbers, um, but I, you raise a very important point, which is why I emphasize these are gonna continue to evolve. So thank you for that point and for your work in Florida. 
So before we thank both Risa and Joanne for today, I want to say that um, I appreciate very much the conversation. I also want to say to Joanne, I appreciate the work that you do as a journalist. I want to point out that we have over a thousand experts on healthcare in this audience. And, we and would I be emailed the conference uh, program to my provider reporter. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> And we'd be happy to provide you with sources at any time. Uh, having been misrepresented in today's Wall Street Journal, I would tell you that we stand ready to work with you to get accuracy in your reporting. But I know that you're accurate in your reporting. So I thank you for being a marauder. And I want to thank, thank Risa thank very, very much for helping us to kick off today's conference. You're going to stand. Thank you. Very good, very good. Excellent. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. And Reese is going to stay for a moment as we move into the next part of our program. I'd like at this time to invite Susan Apold, Susan Lacey, Karen Cox, Lauren Harden, and Diane Spatz to join Risa and me on the stage over here. So one of the Academy's signature initiatives is our Edge Runner program that showcases nurses who are practical innovators and see beyond the status quo and dare to employ new and creative methods to solve health challenges. And Risa has just challenged us to continue to do this work in another direction. Their innovative nurse design models of care and interventions are transforming healthcare delivery for providers and improving health outcomes for patients. Our edge runners are, have successfully demonstrated significant clinical and financial outcomes, a feat we all know is not easily achieved. The sustainability and repl replicability of their programs ensures that their ingenuity will continue to benefit providers and patients throughout our healthcare system and in society. I want to point out that the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation was an earlier supporter of the Edge Runner program. And I am pleased to announce that a few months ago, we received another grant from the foundation to partner with the RAND Corporation on a study of how edge runners are working with individuals, families, and communities to build a culture of health. And Risa, we thank you for that. Thank you. So we have now worked into our annual program acknowledging new edge runners. And these are the new edge runners we're going to acknowledge. But the first are two of our most recent, uh, of these most recently uh, designated edge runners, are Drs. Donald Gard Gardnier uh, and Jeffrey Weiss, but they are unable to be here today. But I would like to share the amazing work that they are doing with their model of care, the Mount Sinai Primary Care Hepatite Hepatitis C Clinical and Research Program. And I know that the chief nurse, Carol Porter, is sitting over here and uh, is with us. Understanding the enormous impact the comorbidities and social determinants of health have on the treatment of hepatitis C, Donald and Jeffrey designed a model to serve patients that are often disqualified from hepatitis C care and under treatment under traditional standards. Using a harm reduction and patient-centered relationship-based nursing framework these underserved and vulnerable patients are engaged in their care and offered assistance with any issue, either concurrently or as a lead-in to treatment. This engagement motivates patients to simultaneously work on their substance use and social issues. The Academy is proud to recognize Donald and Jeffrey as edge runners for the design of their successful nursing approach to hepatitis C care and treatment. To accept this plaque for them is Susan Apold. Uh, and please join us.
Our second team of edge runners, Dr. Susan Lacey and Karen Cox, together designed the American Association of Critical Care Nurses Clinical Scene Investigator, or CSI, Academy. Susan and Karen recognize that traditionally quality improvement projects may not include staff nurses in design and implementation, yet staff nurses are held accountable for the outcomes. The CSI Academy is a 16-month nursing leadership and innovation program. The program empowers hospital-based staff nurses to be the clinician leaders and change agents that they are by teaching them new skills in project management, implementation, evaluation, leadership, and quality improvement methods. AACN's CSI Academy staff, nurse teams, report remarkable clinical and financial results while addressing some of patient care's most costly challenges. Please join me in congratulating Academy Fellows, Drs. Lacey's and Cox, on their remarkable program on being named American Academy of Nursing Edge Runners. The Academy is, very, and I am very proud, to highlight another 2015 edge runner, Lauren Harden. Lauren recognized the need to successfully confront the driving factors that cause some patients to be continually high utilizers of emergency department and inpatient services. To address this, Lauren developed the Complex Care Center a model of care that coordinates and facilitates change by applying a population approach to these vulnerable individuals. Social determinants of health and psychosocial needs are addressed in equally import, as equally important root causes of instability as is the management of the medical disease. Lauren's model has resulted in significant reductions in the number of inpatient admissions and lengths of stay, emergency department visits, and both self-pay charges and total gross charges. It's my honor to recognize Lauren Harden as an American Academy of Nursing edge runner. Fabulous work. And the fourth and final 2015 Edge Runner we are showcasing today is one of our fellows, Dr. Diane Spatz. Diane's model of care is called 10 Steps to Promote and Protect Human Milk and Breastfeeding in Vulnerable Infants. You've got to shorten that title, Diane. <laughs> it extends the crucial benefits of human breast milk to the most vulnerable infants who start life in an NICU. Diane's model closes the gap in care that consequently resulted in the infants most in need of human milk being the least likely to receive it. Through the demonstrated uniqueness of nursing, Diane provides clinicians with the framework and tools to change practice and achieve measurable results that are personalized, convenient, cost-effective, and innovative. Her model has been implemented in hospitals throughout the United States and abroad and educates health professionals on the best practices for the use of human milk and breastfeeding to benefit these vulnerable infants. She's also been a fabulous chair of our expert panel on breastfeeding that has produced wonderful work and policy-related documents. Please join me in applauding Diane Spatz for her amazing work and congratulating her on being an edge runner. The Academy is proud to pay tribute to all of its remarkable innovators who have earned the Edge Runner designation and to those individuals designated as emerging Edge Runners who are following in their footsteps. 
We ask everyone to consider whether you or someone you know is currently transforming health through an innovative nurse design program that improves health outcomes while reducing costs. If so, we encourage you or your innovative colleague to submit an edge runner application so the providers and the public may benefit from their good work. My thanks to you, Risa, as an early supporter of this program that enabled it to grow and inform the work of reforming healthcare in this country. We are very excited about our current study with the RAND Corporation and hope that it will inform the Foundation's work on the culture of health. So let's honor all of these edge runners and thank the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation.